Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me at 10 a.m. in the morning. Uh, I don't know if that's very early for you guys. That's actually very late for me. I have kids. I'm usually awake very early. Um, so yeah, I'm here today to talk about 5G security. So if that's what you wanted to see, you're in the right room. Um, I'll start briefly talking about myself, standard thing you do when you start a talk. Uh, main thing I want to say is that I was here four years ago at Shmukon at the exact same room, I'm pretty sure I was, talking about uh, LTE protocol exploits, and I'm very happy to be back uh, four years later. This time I'm talking about 5G protocol exploits. Uh, just a few things that I, I do, um, mainly my full-time job, which is being a dad, and then I also have another full-time job that does pay me um, as a security architect, and then there's a couple other things uh, that I do. Um, everything that I work research-wise, uh, I post on my website in case you guys are interested. Um, but anyways, uh, moving on, standard disclaimer. This thing that I'm presenting has absolutely nothing to do with my uh, day job. It's just things that I do on research. And again, these are things that if you're interested, I, I usually post on, on my website. So just to start, what I'm going to be talking today is uh, 5G. I personally think that 5G is a buzz term that people use to refer to a lot of technologies. Specifically, for people familiar with this, I'm going to be talking about 3GPP release 15, new radio, which is the standard that defines the mobile portion of 5G uh, networks. And I'm going to be talking about 5G security. Before doing so, I want to kind of like look back and see what has happened in terms of mobile security over the years. Um, We've had a bunch of uh, generations. Everything started with GSM, which used old encryption. In their defense, the encryption was strong when it was designed, but right now a smartphone has more computing capacity than a supercomputer in the 80s. So if the encryption right now, it's broken. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's an insecure network, and there's no mutual authentication. If you want to know about it, GSM insecurity, you can ask uh, Karsten and Sylvain. They were the first ones to uh, demonstrate that at CCC, I think, in 2009. Weirdly, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but research skipped mostly 3G. I'm not sure why. And then uh, 4G LTE came and uh, supposedly had stronger encryption and mutual authentication, which, which it does, but it was also broken in a number of ways. And there's been a lot of researchers um, that have been doing a great uh, amount of work uh, in that regard. And now we have 5G that comes with this optional feature to prevent teamsy catching and it's supposedly more secure. And, and there's a lot of people talking about it, but we're going to see today if it's really uh, more secure or if things have improved. Just a little bit of a timeline. Hopefully you can see it well. Um, by the way, I would take input on like how to put a plot like this that looks nice. It took me forever to do this, and I'm not really happy. Notice that the axis, the, 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 you know, it's changing constantly. But essentially, uh, in a nutshell, GSM was uh, deployed in uh, 1991, and there, there was a, f uh, a number of uh, crypto attacks against the crypto algorithms that it uses in 2004, but uh, Karsten uh, didn't demonstrate how to break it in a system-wide way until 2009. Uh, th the main reason behind that is a bunch of open source tools that uh, appeared throughout the years that have been very useful in terms of research. Osmocom, BB, OpenBTS, and, and the like. Uh, LTE, the standards were published in 2008. Uh, deployment was roughly 2012. And um, the first system, system attacks were roughly 2016. Myself and a team in Berlin, who has been doing excellent work in that area, by the way. Um, one of the main reasons uh, was OpenLTE. OpenLTE is the tool I used, or the stack I used to implement my first MZ catcher. And then OpenLT is uh, dead now. It's not maintained anymore, but everything, all the research essentially has migrated to SRS LTE. Uh, and as I said earlier, there's a lot of really, really good papers finding issues on LTE over the last uh, three years. And then in terms of 5G, release 15 was published in 2017, late 2017. Security specifications were out in March of 2018, and uh, there's already a lot of issues uh, found. Um, so in a nutshell, GSM, 18 years from deployment to first attacks. LTE, eight years from, uh, from standard to first attacks. Three years from deployment to first attacks. 5G, it's not even live yet, and people are finding issues, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, why is that happening? Well, the research uh, ecosystem has changed uh, a lot. On one hand, you have the uh, open source tools that I was just mentioning. 
SLS LTE is, as of now, the tool that I would say almost everybody uses for LTE security research. Open LTE was the one that started it all, and it's the, one, the first one that I started using, but it's not maintained anymore. And then some people in Europe use open air interface. I myself have never used it, so I don't have much insight on it. Uh, there's a bunch of really, really good academic teams publishing amazing work. I have some examples here. Uh, if I left anybody out of the list, like nothing personal, it's just some, some examples in no particular order. And also another thing is that mainstream media has kind of like gained a lot of interest on in this, so now, um, you know, they're publishing a lot of articles um, on, on this type of thing, so people get to know more what's happening in, in this uh, domain. Just briefly, and with this I'll mention, I'm going to post my slides uh, at some point between now and like Monday, Tuesday, so all these links, references, things like that, you can access them from there. But just, just this is a topic that I'm very, very interested in. I've been uh, doing a, a big deal of like, you know, publishing things and writing about over the last uh, few years. So before I go into 5G, I want to talk a bit again about LTE security. I'm going to keep this brief because it's mostly covering things that I essentially told you guys four years ago and things that researchers have presented over the last four years. But it's just to set the stage so you get the context on how things look like on LTE before we can move on uh, to 5G. Before we start, some basic jargon. Again, because of now this topic being a lot in the media, you might be familiar with most of these, if not all of them, but just, you know, things that I'm, I might be referring throughout the talk. Uh, there's a thing called the IMEI, which is the, think of it of the, as the MAC address of your mobile device. Not a smartphone, anything that connects to a cellular network has an IMEI, and that's kind of like the MAC address, or a unique identifier for the hardware. Then you have the IMSI, which is the unique identifier for the uh, SIM card, which uh, should never be disclosed. This is a long story, but essentially if you have the somebody's IMSI, you can exploit issues on SS7 networks and you can locate them you know, from the other side of the world. And there's a lot of things that you can do if you have somebody's IMSI. Um, in 5G, they refer there's a different uh, secret ID. It's called SUPE, which is Subscriber Unique Private Identifier. That's kind of like the equivalent to the IMSI in, in 5G. And then there's a thing that they, I, I don't know how you phrase it, but I call it SUCI, S-U-C-I. It stands for Subscriber Unique Concealed Identifier, which is essentially your SUPI encrypted with the public key of your operator. And I'll talk more about this later on, so don't worry too much about it. And then in order to not be using this IMSI that I mentioned uh, a moment ago, when you connect to a network, you derive a temporary ID, uh, TIMSI, which is the one that you usually use when you are talking with the network and, and whatnot. And then there's the MISDIN, which is essentially your phone number, the one that you use to dial. I, I, I like to compare the MISDIN to a URL. The, the TIMSI, for example, could be like an IP, and then, but that's hard for a human to remember, so then uh, we have the MISDIN, which is the phone number. All right, so um, how do things look like in an LTE network? And I'm not going to talk about all these nodes. The important thing here is that you have stuff that connects to the cell network, to LTE, smartphones and other stuff, the IoT. And then the base stations in LTE are known as uh, InnoBs. And that's the uh, uh, RAN or radio access network portion of a 4G network. And then you have the EPC, which stands for Enhanced Packet Core, which is the core network. There's a bunch of things that do authentication, yada, yada, and logistics, and then eventually user traffic flows through some gateways. Again, I don't want to you know, spend too much time on this because it's not really entirely necessary for the talk. Um, this is how it looks like when, for example, you turn on your phone for the first time or you walk out of the subway or essentially you're connecting to the network. I'm not going to go through all these messages again. It's just so you get an idea. There's a bunch of handshakes between the mobile device and the base station. Then there's a bunch of like handshakes in order to authenticate yourself. And then, you know, there's some handshakes in the core network to set up a channel through the gateways and then you're done. Um, what I talked about four years ago is that all these messages are the ones that are transmitted or received over the air, and these are things that a, an adversary or somebody like a curious person with a radio can intercept, analyze, and attempt to uh, spoof. Um, if we look at this uh, in, in real, this is a real capture of a, an, an LTE uh, device connecting to the network, this is how it looks like. I know this is very small, don't worry about everything. You just like can see that some of the you know, names here kind of like match what you were seeing uh, here. You have a bunch of handshakes and whatnot, and eventually you start th seeing uh, ciphered uh, control traffic and eventually ciphered uh, you know, user data. What happens is that until you have a cryptographical handshake and you do mutual authentication and set up encryption and whatnot, 
all those messages prior to that point are unprotected and you know not authenticated not encrypted and essentially you can abuse that you can uh, you can sniff them obviously you can spoof them you can do certain things and there's an, a, a number of other messages that have the same problem and then this is essentially the main point that I presented four years ago um, independently of whether an LTE network has strong authentic uh, mutual authentication and strong encryption any any mobile device exchanges of substantial messages of with a base station back and forth, uh, and this base station could be malicious or not. It's just as, as long as it broadcasts the right information, you're just going to trust it and talk with it. And the vast majority of exploits that have been identified over the last three years, not to say almost all of them, um, are essentially exploit these, exploit these what I refer to as pre-authentication uh, messages. Um, things that can be done, you can intercept broadcast messages that the towers are, are, you know, are transmitting, and um, these allow you to identify like base stations that belong to a given operator, uh, allow you to, to uh, identify ad hoc deployments for say first responders. Uh, this gives you also an idea of what will be the optimal transmitted power you have to set up for your rogue base station you know, to maximize how many people connect to you. High priority frequencies, which is something that the team in Berlin discovered that uh, allows you to set up like in a very optimal way a rogue base station because everybody kind of wants to connect to these, uh, those, to these um, frequencies. IMSI catching, and this is, by the way, the part that I'm kind of like skipping maybe a bit too fast, but again, the slides will be posted, and this is stuff that other people have presented over the last three years, so that's why I don't want to spend too much time on this. IMSI catching was something that until late 2015, it was generally thought not to be possible on LTE, but it's actually, it actually was very well possible. Uh, as of today, just a couple of lines of code on SLS LTE allow you to uh, catch IMSIs very easily. And not too long ago, operators that were still uh, paging devices with the IMSI. They would try to page you with your Teamsy, and if they didn't get a response, because maybe you don't have signal, you're in an airplane or you're like in the subway, they would try again using your IMSI, which was definitely not a, not a good idea. That doesn't happen anymore, by the way. Um, other things that you could do would be uh, uh, brick uh, devices, or soft, uh, so what I call soft downgrade to GSM, or silently downgrading to GSM by abusing the attach reject or uh, tracking area update reject message, you could fool a device to believe that it's not allowed to connect to uh, LTE and that it has to connect to a GSM. And since this message is not authenticated, the phone implicitly trusts it's the operator telling the phone to do that and they did it. Um, and this is something, again, that I presented uh, four years ago and other teams have uh, presented. There's different ways in which you can track devices. Um, there's ways to uh, trigger paging messages in a silent way. If you start typing a message via WhatsApp, you see those dot, dot, dot on the screen of the other person. Even before you send the message, the network is you know, sending stuff to the, to the recipient of the message. So by doing that, you can uh, cause a paging message to occur be without even sending a, 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 an actual message. And if you then delete the message, you already triggered the paging message, but you didn't really send anything. Uh, one of the things I showed four years ago was uh, how to track devices using the RNTI, which it will, be become, will become le relevant later on this talk. And then there was other ways that, uh, that you could track devices. More importantly, this paper was one of my favorite papers over the last couple of years. These guys found out a way to um, essentially tweak the ciphertext of DNS queries over LTE to change the, the destination and source IP. So they would essentially uh, man in the middle of your connection. You think that you're browsing gmail.com, but what you're getting is their gmail.com. And uh, one of the things, one of the steps that they use to bootstrap this attack is uh, RNTI tracking, uh, which for the record, when I presented this four years ago, and then 3GPP, they published a document that analyzed all the exploits that people were presenting, and they explicitly said that RNTI tracking was not a security issue which I thought it was like interesting. And, uh, and then these guys essentially used it for this. So I'm, I still think it's a security issue. Really interesting paper. I really uh, suggest you guys read it. I think it's one of my favorite papers over the last uh, few years. Um, things get even more interesting. Uh, now with open source tools, there's a thing called SRS UE. It's part of the SRS LTE package. And this allows you to pretend to be a mobile device when you talk with the network. Until now, I've been talking about things that you can do messing up with the packets that a base station sends to a phone, so you can mess up with the phone. But with SRS UE, you can actually start messing up with the, the network operator. You can send arbitrary garbage to the MME or elements in the, in the core network. And if you were to like crash them by fuzzing them, that would be pretty bad. There's a first paper that I also liked a lot by a team in KAIST in Korea that uh, implemented some uh, uh, uplink fuzzing, and they found very interesting things. 
And even cooler, like right now, the same team in Korea, they came up with this trick that, so you don't have to set up your rogue base station to do any of these things. They came up with this trick where they essentially put, imagine in like time and frequency where, where the signals for LTE are like flying over the, over the air. They interject there uh, one of these messages that you need to exploit some of these attacks and the phone thinks that it's coming from the real base station. So you don't have to set up a rogue base station to do any of these things that I just uh, told about. Uh, again, really cool paper, really I recommend you guys to, um, to read it. Okay, we're going, doing good in time. Now is when I start talking about 5G. So um, let's look at how things look like in 5G in terms of um, like network architecture, the protocol, how do devices connect to the network and whatnot. And then we'll start looking at uh, how these, you know, what are the implications of, uh, of these uh, in terms of security. So um, architecture for 5G. Uh, this is how it looks like. On one hand, you have the stuff that connects to the cellular network. I'm a big fan of uh, uh, buzzwords and terms like thinking up a lot of traction. I'm a big fan of like this IoT thing. So on one hand, you have the connected world, uh, all these things that are connecting to the cellular network. Um, then you have the 5G base stations, which are uh, called G node Bs, uh, although I just call everything base station. And that's the 5G RAM of the, of the portion of the network. And then on the core network, things are kind of like similar to an LTE but with different names. Not really relevant for the content of this talk what each of one of these nodes um, does. But you also have, you know, like th there's a complete split between user plane and, and control plane. You have a bunch of nodes that do authentication and blah, blah, and all the logistics. And then traffic flows uh, through, through here. Lots of interesting things. Although I'm talking about things that are potentially an issue in 5G, there's a lot of interesting things that you can do in 5G. You can do network slicing, you can do your service-based, um, uh, it's a service-based architecture, so you can set up things in a way to craft each one of the slices of the network to provide the, the, the specific requirements that a different type of device or network uh, has. So there's a lot of cool things that you can do. Again, out of the scope uh, of what we're discussing on this talk, though. Um, so how does, how do things look like in terms of a device connecting to a network? There's two ways in which devices connect to a network, two ways in which you can deploy 5G. Um, there's what it's referred to as non-standalone uh, mode and standalone mode. You'll see them referred as NSA and SA. Non-standalone mode is essentially kind of like, okay, let's hurry up, let's put something out there that is 5G. Uh, it's just using the 5G radio, the high throughput and low latency radio, but reuse everything else from LTE. I'll show in a moment how this looks like. But what you're doing is you're using absolutely everything in LTE, and once you're done, then flip your like traffic over the air to a 5G high capacity, um, you know, uh, access network. But everything else stays the same for LTE. And standalone mode is what we actually is an actual 5G deployment. Um, um, so, how do things look like in? non-standalone. So when a device attaches in a non-standalone mode, you just start with an LTE basic NAS attached. That's what I just showed earlier. And same messages, you're talking with your, you're currently talking with an LTE base station, a bunch of handshakes, handshakes with the core network. Authentication happens at the core network of LTE. So any issues, any IMSI catching, anything like that is going to be just, it's going to be root caused by the issues that you have on LTE. And then essentially you're all set, you're connected. As part of this process, the mobile device indicates the LTE network that it does support 5G radio uh, by flipping a bit called DCNR bit. I don't remember what it stands for, but it's a bit on the attached request message, which is, recall from earlier, an unprotected message. So I don't think it's, this will have any security implications, but you could very easily fool the network and make it believe that you have uh, 5G capabilities. Maybe if you had a bunch of devices doing this in a given area, you would start getting the, the, the network kind of like busy or overloaded by trying to process your know, connection to 5G. But anyways, it's just an, an unprotected message, so you can pretend that you have 5G access. Let's say we're in a legitimate uh, deployment. Once this happens, um, you first have, this is the, the, how the flow of user traffic looks like at the beginning. You're sending from the UE, to, from the device to the base station, and then through the gateways to the internet. And then you essentially, there's a couple of messages between the, the G node B, uh, the E node B, the LTE base station, and the 5G base station to set things up. And then you do a couple of handshakes 
with the 5G base station and you eventually connect with the 5G base station. So now the, the flow of the traffic, and apologies, I saw that something got cut down here. But essentially the flow of the traffic is the same, it's just that instead of going through the LTE base station, now you're going through the 5G base station. Um, nothing, you know, drastic. You're just reusing everything LTE. And again, uh, just because these are things that are known, all these messages here are unprotected, and these particular messages that you're exchanging with the 5G base station are also unprotected. Things that you can intercept, you can spoof, and you can abuse in, in certain uh, scenarios. Um, now let's talk about standalone. This is when you act have an actual uh, 5G deployment and you're not reusing anything from LTE. For what matters, in this case, you don't really need to have an LTE base station, you don't have to have LTE signal, no GSM, it's, it's completely a standalone 5G um, attachment. In this case, it, it kind of, again, I'm not, going to go, I'm not going to go through all these messages because it's not really important, but it looks kind of similar to what happens in LTE. There's a bunch of handshakes with the base station, a bunch of handshakes with a, uh, a device that you know, talks with these 12 devices for authentication, and eventually things are set up such that, and by the way, I'm, the, the 5G attach is so complex that just the message flow is, is a PDF that has, I think, like five pages. I made a very, very simplified view here. If you wanna see how things look like uh, in reality, just you can go uh, to this uh, source here. But eventually, you just have you know, traffic flowing and you're connected to the, to the network. Uh, what is very important to talk about here is that these messages up to this point are also unprotected. So we have the same issue we, have, we had in, um, in, in, in LTE. Before you start doing uh, cryptographical handshakes to validate the identity of each, you know, of Alice and Bob, and you encrypt your channel, there's a number of messages that are not protected. And you know, we'll be talking about the implications of these uh, shortly. But um, so one thing that I promised for this talk is that I will be showing you real traffic from real uh, 5G devices. So we, f before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about you know, the challenges and what it takes to be able to capture 5G traffic and analyze it at this point. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about, um, again, um, what do you need or what would you need in order to say sniff 5G traffic and abuse these type of messages and, and, and whatnot. Um, so, although as of today, sniffing, downlink, LTE, traffic, user or control traffic, it's a commodity thing. You can do it with a cheap software radio, a mildly uh, powerful laptop. Uh, it's not the same case in 5G. Uh, any of the things I'll be discussing today, you cannot really do them with any known, at least, uh, open source tool or any standard software radios. Any statement otherwise is incorrect. Like the technology is not there yet. The, the, the tools that allow you to do things in 5G are very expensive and, it's, and they are very limited in, in scope. Essentially, um, so let's say a 5G deployment with 100 megahertz bandwidth. If you guys are signal processing people like me, you might recall you know, like classes in undergrad and Nyquist and, and Shannon, essentially, um, you know, you need to sample a signal with at least, the, the sampling frequency has to be at least twice the bandwidth of the signal and all these things. <laughs> so uh, in LTE, LTE 10 megahertz bandwidth, if you ever played with say SRS LTE setting up a test base station in a Faraday cage, uh, very important, uh, you, you might have struggled because at 10 megahertz, you need to be, your PC needs to be able to push and receive 32 mega samples per second. And that's already quite a bit. So imagine, and, and that's for a 10 megahertz bandwidth. Imagine if you're doing that at 100 megahertz bandwidth 5G. Like, you know, you, you, you can do the math. Um, there's a couple of things op or solutions that do uh, open source or like not really open source, like commercial. You pay and they give you the source code or a binary. There's a couple of interesting tools already exist uh, existing. There's a lot of exciting work. It's uh, very uh, early but uh, evolving very rapidly. But there's a bunch of tools that you can uh, play with this. Um, this is just an example. Don't take this as a, as a complete list or any particular order. There's just some solutions that you can use to explore this type of things. I particularly like that SRS LTE, which is full uh, open source, already implements a couple of the 5G uh, NAS uh, functions, which is pretty useful for um, you know, uh, early uh, fuzzing. I don't have time to do these things, but if anybody in the room is interested, you know, these are things that kind of like, I don't wanna say low hanging fruit, but uh, you know, interesting things that can be done. Um, in terms of software radio, a high end, USRP, the USRP X series, has uh, 120 megahertz of bandwidth. 
and uh, maybe you could try to capture 5G with that. But I don't know if you've played, if you've played with software radio and you might have done the classic mistake of starting to save like raw IQ samples on a file on disk and you let that thing running for, you know, like you forget to stop it. And uh, essentially you end up with a huge uh, file on disk. And that's say for example LTE at 10 megahertz, 32 mega samples per second. If you're doing, you know, if your bandwidth is 100 megahertz for 5G, say that you did 200 mega samples per second, you would need more, but let's say you're doing 200 mega samples per second, like you, you can do the math, it's a very, very big file. It's a very expensive file to process and uh, forget it in a standard PC or in like a computing, maybe on A6 or like a specifically crafted hardware maybe, but on, on standard computers, forget about processing that in real time. So essentially, there's not yet any, uh, you know, SDR based uh, sni 5G sniffing. You can do it for a D, but forget it in, in 5G. Um, the captures that I'll be showing are from real uh, release 15 5G devices, some lab test devices, some uh, emulators and base stations. They were captured with a tool called uh, WaveJudge. And, um, and the analysis that I'll be doing or the capture I'll be, show I'll be showing are done with the WaveJudge uh, software for which I have a, a, a license. Um, these type of test and experimentation 5G devices are in very early stages of product life, uh, they are very expensive, and they're in constant development. Uh, and they have a lot of limitations. The maximum duration of the capture, you, you're capturing so many sam IQ samples per second that the maximum amount of samples that you can hold is limited. So you can only capture about a couple of seconds or a few seconds of, of, of actual uh, traffic. And that's a huge file anyways. Um, no real-time processing of the capture. You'll see that when I load a capture, it takes a few seconds for the thing to crunch through the Q IQ samples and show you the results. And it's very, very hard to get an entire user flow, a complete attach, and then user traffic in just one capture. That's why you'll see that the captures I show you are very kind of limited in, in scope. Um, I do acknowledge that it's not easy to have access to this type of equipment, but if anybody in the room, anybody seeing this is uh, either a PhD student, postdoc, professor, and you're interested in working with tools like this, um, definitely shoot me an email or like, you know, or come talk to me. Um, I'm involved in something, I don't wanna talk about this now, but I'm involved in something where uh, we're definitely looking for uh, smart people and students, postdocs, professors to uh, start working on research on some of these areas. So, all right, uh, we're doing good on time. Let's start talking about 5G security. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is one of my favorite is this uh, protection for IMSI catching that 5G presents. They, pr they leverage this a new secret identifier, the SUPI, uh, the SUSI, SUKI, um, which essentially is encrypting your IMSI or your SUPI using the public key of the operator. Um, sounds like a feasible way of fixing this. Um, it, it, it's interesting or it's good that it also works in roaming scenarios. When, when, even when you're roaming, the only one that needs to know your IMSI or needs your IMSI to do any type of authentication is your home operator. So encrypting your uh, IMSI or your SUPI and sending it all, all over the world to your home operator, that works. They are the only ones that need to decrypt it. So this is actually an interesting thing that they presented uh, that uh, if it was implemented, it would potentially uh, um, prevent IMSI catching. However, it turns out to be broken. Uh, there's flaws that some team in Purdue that I, I know very well, they identified on the way that you page devices that allow to essentially, long story short, if you trigger paging messages to a given device and you capture that traffic, you can analyze it and you can brute force uh, the IMSI out of it. Something that was published, uh, when was this? February of last year um, and it was widely uh, discussed. So, you know, it's broken. Yeah. Uh, even if it wasn't broken, it's an optional feature. And history tells us that optional features on cellular uh, protocols are never implemented. And not only, not only that, but um, the, the specifications leave so many things that outside of the scope of, of, the, of the standard. Um, I, I'm not going to tell you what I do for a living, but I'm a security architect, and when I think of a PKI system or a system that distributes public keys, and you just tell me I'm putting a public key in the SIM card, I'm like, wait, but, you know, like, how do you manage that key? How do you rotate that key? How do you put that key there? Where do you keep that key, at, like the, the corresponding secret key? There's so many things outside of the scope of the specification that this is likely going to be a deterrent on, on implementation. So anyways, there's that. Uh, 
just a quick thing, one of my favorite things to do when I look at specifications is to do control F, uh, scope, out of scope, some combination of words like that, and seeing the types of things that they leave outside of the, of the scope. I'm, I'm putting together standards is a hard job. I'm, I don't wanna you know, be too critical with this, but sometimes it blows my mind the types of things that they leave outside of the scope of the specifications. Like uh, they don't tell you anything. They don't tell you how to provision how to provision that uh, public key in the SIM card, or if you want to rotate it, how to do that. So if you know if you don't tell them how to do it, um, either everybody will do it in a different way. So then you cannot use the same SIM for everybody, or nobody will do it. Or anyways, just food for thought. Um, so now let's start looking at actual traffic. Um, this is a capture that I'll show later, kind of like live. But this is a capture of a. Uh, of a portion of the you know message flow that a device has with a with a real 5G base station to attach to the network, um, it's hard to see here, so I'm just going to zoom in real quick uh, to the messages themselves. And um, I, as I mentioned earlier, all these messages are un unencrypted, unprotected, and they can be intercepted, sniffed. They can you can try to abuse them in different ways. And there's other things that also have the same uh, issue um, on 5G. And now my question is, does this sound familiar to you guys? Um, hopefully the answer is yes. It, it, when I looked at this, I was like, this sounds very familiar. And the types of messages, I don't know if you remember like the, the, the captures that I showed earlier for LTE, but later when you get the slides, you can compare. It's, it's very similar. The protocol is very similar on how you connect to the network and whatnot. So you know, things are very similar. The same messages are unprotected. So it's very likely that we're going to have the same uh, issues in LTE. So again, Four years ago, I gave you guys like one kind of like tagline for my talk. I want this one to be my tagline for this talk. Um, when we talk about 5G, regardless of mutual authentication, uh, encryption, whatever, any 5G mobile device will engage in a substantial exchange of messages that are unprotected with any 5G base station, regardless of it you know, could be a legitimate base station or not legitimate and uh, that advertises itself with the right broadcast information. And that right broadcast information is things that they broadcast in the clear. So essentially, what was an issue in LTE is now an issue today with, uh, with 5G, exactly the same problem. Just because of that, and by abusing these pre-authentication messages, most of the LTE exploits that I found myself four years ago and that others found over the last three years also apply to 5G, which is not good. That also renders um, SUPI encryption potentially useless and still allows you to track devices in, in a number of ways. I kind of wrote a blog kind of thing about this. Uh, I don't know when it was, but a while ago, in case you're interested. So what's happening here? Um, so 5G still doesn't provide you any way to cryptographically verify that you are talking with really a base station from a legitimate operator before you start engaging on a communication with it. Uh, there's a public key on the SIM, so you could could do something like this. And for the record, this is not what happens in 5G. But you could maybe sign messages from the base station with that key, so the, the phone can verify, oh, I'm talking really with my operator. Um, could, that could happen. That's not what happens. But let's say that, that was the proposal. Then what happens when you're roaming? When you're roaming, you have a public key for your home operator not for your roaming operator. So what do you do with all the messages that you exchange with the, with the roaming operator? There's not really anything you can do. You just have to trust them implicitly. So essentially, even if you did this, that it's not what they do, you would just spoof a roaming operator, You'd, your phone would start talking with it, and then you could abuse those messages to do all the things that I was talking about. And you would have the same um, issues. Um, in 5G, you can still sniff uh, broadcast messages, which is what you need to then set up a row base station. In all fairness, this is a difficult problem to solve. You, when you broadcast these messages, there's nothing between you and the, and, the, and the devices that would allow you to encrypt it. So you could encrypt it, but how do you encrypt it so everybody knows about it? If you encrypt it in a way that everybody can decrypt it, then that means that every phone, every SIM card has the same key, so then you know, an adversary can have the same key. So encrypt this information is not really an easy thing to do. But, so I'm not trying to say this is a bad thing, it's just that like, these things are like, broadcasted in the clear, you just have to capture them, and that tells you what you have to set up on your rogue base station to pretend to be a legitimate uh, operator. Um, 
our NTI-based tracking, which again, 3GPP said that it was not a security issue and nobody would ever use it for anything malicious, of course not. Um, it's still a problem. I'll show you this later with a real capture, but essentially in the first handshake that you have, it's called the uh, random access, uh, through the random access channel, there's a message called random access response that the tower sends to the device, and that's where the tower is assigning an RNTI to the device. And there's a message that is sent in the clear, you can extract that, uh, that ID, and that allows you to essentially distinguish um, that device from other devices. All my captures are only one base station, one device, so there's not that much traffic in the middle, but imagine that you capture traffic here and you have like messages encrypted mixed from many, many devices. The way you tell apart one device from the other one is by using the RNTI, and that's still a problem in, in 5G. So let me see, we have 15 minutes. So yeah, let's talk, let's do like demo, and it's not really a demo, but like let's look at some actual uh, traffic captures. Let's see if I can show you these guys. You should, oh, you're not, okay. Let me reset this for a second. Let's see, try to see if you can show you. Are we back? Are we back? Are we back? Come on. Huh. I don't know why I cannot show you this now. That's very interesting. Huh? Mm, interesting. Any idea, AV guys, to get this? Yeah. I have I have captures on like backup slides at the end, so I can show the stuff anyways. But it would be kind of fun to be able to show you the captures live. Okay, come on, come on. Yeah. Interesting. Duplicate. Yeah. Yay! All right. So this is a real 5G traffic capture from a real 5G device. And now that I don't have the timer from the presenter more is when I want to keep an eye on the phone. Yeah. Uh, so this is a real capture. Uh, you can see here things that, are, that matter. When you see here D or U, U stands for uplink, D, downlink. Here you have the first, uh, well, you have the broadcast messages that I showed you earlier in the slides uh, cover, hiding certain things. I don't wanna open them because from them you can see um, operator, like certain information that I don't wanna confuse people. These things are like operator agnostic, device agnostic. These are problems with the protocol, but just in case I don't wanna open the broadcast messages so you are like, aha, this is from this lab. It means that they are vulnerable or something. So I will not open the broadcast messages, but you can see, I was telling you that the random access response message that the network sends back to the, to the device, okay, now everything works good. Um, one of the things that contain, well, one of the things that it contains is what it's called the timing advance command. This is uh, the tower telling the device uh, the distance between the device and the tower in, in, in time. So unless you have a lot of multipath or like signal is bouncing off many, many walls, that essentially gives you an idea. You can capture this traffic and that gives you an idea of how far a given device is from a given tower. So if you know where the tower is and you capture this for multiple towers for the same device, you can start kind of trilaterating and figuring out what device is. And another thing that it, it, it assigns is this RNTI here, 372. So um, in this case, you know, there's again, only one base station, only one device, but imagine that you had a ton of traffic here encrypted and not encrypted for many devices. What you would do if you're you know, intercepting this for like some whatever, some exploit, you would be able to tell what device is what because you would see that uh, all the traffic, from the moment you connect to the network, all the traffic for like a given device has an, an ID in the clear in every message that is the RNTI, in this case, 372. So this is how you see that these are like the device, messages from this device. We have the, the device sends an RRC setup request message to the base station with a bunch of things in here, not really important. Base station re replies with uh, an RRC setup. There's a lot of things here, and I'm not going to go through all these things, but there's a lot of things here that are very interesting, very juicy information, and uh, there's ways that maybe you can try to abuse them to fool the device into doing the wrong thing or, or whatnot. The base station replies with an RRC setup complete. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to show this. So I was supposed to show you this. So you see that, uh, wait a minute, uh, here. So this is a 5G uh, capture. Uh, you, know, you can see here the carrier frequency 
uh, one thing that I just want to note here is that we are doing um, release 15.6.0 June 2019. So this is a capture that it's from devices that are compliant with this uh, release. So release 15 uh, traffic. Uh, this is something I wanted to show at the beginning. If I, w if I had time and like we, there was other things we were interested in, I could start showing you things that are more like in the physical layer and other layers, other messages and traffic that you can also capture in the clear. But I just want to focus on the specific messages that are interesting here. Um, I'll talk about this message in a moment, about something that was presented at Black Hat last year. But this is a device called UE Cap Capability and Query, which is the base station asking the device, like, hey, tell me what do you support, what can you do, and blah, 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 sending the clear. And the response the device sends is um, a large blob. Hold on, where's the response? Oh, here, the response, UE Capability Information. This is a large blob of data that the device is sending the base station telling it like, yeah, I support this radio, I support this encryption, I support yeah, yeah, all these things. Um, so actually, this message kind of ties up with the next thing I want to talk. This uh, is related to something that was presented at Black Hat uh, this year. So I want to make sure that we talk about that. Uh, let me go back to this. Good. This UE capability inquiry, this, there was a talk in, at Black Hat last year. It's a known vulnerability that they presented at Black Hat this year. Uh, this message can be abused to fingerprint devices and the type of device. And they also presented these cool ways in which you can have a beating down attack and a way to uh, drain the battery. The, the presenters have implemented this on LTE with software radio. But uh, one thing that I wanted to say is that based on the analysis of this traffic, you can see that it's also possible. These things that they presented in Black Hat are also possible in in 5G, <coughs> excuse me. So just to sum up so we can go into questions, how do things look like going from here? Like, let, let's talk about like the potential roadmap for security. Um, the, I just told you about the current state of affairs uh, in 5G security. A number of things that have been identified, not just by myself, but a, a, a bunch of people. I'll, I'll talk about a paper now in a second that uh, found a lot of issues. And again, this is a topic that fascinates me. This is another slide that I put here just for reference later. You can like go and read that. But it, I find fascinating how neighbors are not even live yet and we found so many issues already that hopefully we'll fix. Um, there was a paper published recently. Let me see when. I have the year, not the month. It was sometime last year, I think last summer. Uh, this paper is excellent. These guys did a formal protocol verification of the 5G specification, I think with Tamarin and they found a lot of issues on the standard. Uh, so again, this is just an example of exciting work going on in this area. Um, but let's talk about like the main issue that we have here. The main challenge in cellular networks is that, and that's the way I kind of like compare it with uh, technology everybody's familiar with, there's not much difference between you connecting to a cellular network than you accepting a self-signed self certificate. The implications are different. Cellular networks are layer one and two, uh, uh, self-signed certificate, they could essentially, you know, man in the middle you and steal credentials and whatnot. But still, conceptually, it's the same thing. You would not really trust, uh, hopefully nobody in this room would trust a self-signed certificate and then type in their credit card number or their credentials. And if you would, talk with the person sitting next to you and ask them why, it's not a good idea. <laughs> but if you would not, then why would you trust a plain text broadcast message that claims to be your operator? You're essentially seeing a thing that it's telling you, I swear I'm your operator, you should talk with me, and your phone talks with it. That's not good. And that's been a problem that we've had for all the Gs, like 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G. Um, oh, the timer restarted, so I don't know what time it is now. Okay, I wanna wrap up. So, and using public keys without explaining or telling you how to use them and how to, how to manage them, how to rotate them, that's not a good idea. So what are things that you could do? Again, I was comparing that with like, uh, you know, PKI and digital certificates. Perhaps that's an option we could explore. That's a mature technology that makes the internet trustworthy to use. And I know there's a lot of people here that like maybe don't feel that, that way. I personally feel, com feel comfortable typing out my credit card number or my uh, credentials on a trustworthy side that has a valid certificate. Um, so in general, I feel like the internet is trustworthy. So it, it's very mature technology. Why don't we use it? Um, it's, it's, you know, it would be, how would you do it? I don't know, like probably you don't want to have, or nobody would accept a single uh, certificate authority. Maybe each uh, operator runs a like sub certificate authority and then each country has a neutral entity that runs the, the like the national certificate authority. 
This would give you flexibility for, and again, that's beyond the scope of my research, but if country A doesn't trust country B for whatever reason, you know, then there's ways that you can just like not trust certificates uh, issued by that country, and you know, it gives you that flexibility. Um, and uh, you know, essentially, you would have a list of a, a list of uh, uh, trusted certificate uh, uh, certificate authorities you would have on, on your SIM card. Not easy. It would require a lot of collaboration between standards and industry. Not clear how you would do certificate revocation because your phone is not always online. But I think it's uh, potentially possible. And just to finish, I want to talk about like how a team in Purdue published a paper that, in my opinion, it's the best thing that has happened in cellular security research in like many, many years. That's for me like the best paper that has been published in many, many years. And what they did is essentially they prototype X509 certs on LTE and modifying uh, SRS LTE. And there's a couple of caveats. They have to like trim the certificate because there's not enough space to put them and whatnot. But I think that that's the beginning of something real good. We just have to get all together and come up with a way that we can uh, use these uh, in cellular networks so we can prevent these issues from happening. And with that, uh, thank you very much. All right. I'm being told we have five minutes for questions. And before I take questions, again, PhD students, postdocs, professors, interested in like playing with tools like these and working in research like this, definitely shoot me an email. I don't really do much Twitter. I mostly post videos from concerts I go to and things like that. But if you, you can contact me through Twitter. I'll announce where I post the slides on Twitter, so you can look there as well. But anyways, just FYI. All right, happy to take questions. Yes. I think they are recording, so I'll repeat the question. Um, and they're asking me if I see more in the field NSA versus uh, SA deployments. Uh, I'm actually not seeing anything in the field. It's not really live. These were captures taken in like uh, labs and, and where they have test beds, where they are essentially testing devices before, like pre-deployment. Pre as far as I know, there's no, nothing on the field. But I'm sure like OEMs and telcos are doing tests somewhere out there. But I have no idea about these things. Are the manufacturers and operators looking at this X509, or is that just academics? As far as I know, um, the industry is aware of us researchers telling them that this is a good idea. Uh, I know that the researchers are looking at it. I'm not aware of uh, telcos, OEMs, or the industry doing an actual hands-on work. But I'm just not aware. Maybe there's something. You know, like when you're in the industry, you, keep to, you tend to keep things secret and whatnot. And I haven't spoken with anybody in the standards for a while, so I don't know what's the state, the status on that. But as far as I know, no, it's just researchers. And the software you're using in your demo, was that uh, open core 5G? Can you say that again? The software that you're using in the demo, was it the open software, core? No, the software I was using in the demo is called WaveJet. It's from this company called Sanjole. Uh, it's essentially used to capture and analyze 5G traffic. Uh, it's not cheap, but uh, um, I strongly recommend you guys to use it. And again, researchers, students, PhD, postdocs, we can uh, get you started with this type of uh, gear. <laughs> not cheap. Not, not cheap for like, I, I cannot pay for it, and like a PhD student cannot pay for it. I don't want to talk about like those things. Yes, go ahead. Uh, is it possible to use a rogue base station in a null protection scheme in order to get the user equipment to divulge the unencrypted SUPI or their NZ? So I, I would assume that I could run a null protection scheme, a G node B, and then force a user's mobile that, handset. Yeah, that's a good question. That's implementation based. Um, I do know for a fact that the specifications explicitly tell you that there has to be a mode in which the SUPI, so the IMSI, is sent in the clear when you're in an emergen emergency something call. Right. And if you can trick the device to think that it's in an emergency situation, it's going to disclose the SUPI in the clear. Well, it, it would also, um, it also, the handset has to support that mode. So if I advertise only that mode is available yeah. on the G node B, yes. would it connect? Yeah. Uh, e, e, the the non-encryption, non-authentication mode has to be supported by the network and the phone. And it's uh, based on, on implementation whether the phone is OK with that. You could implement a phone that decided not to uh, accept that. But I don't know why this is not uh, some, I mean, there's some reasons why that would not be happening. But that's similar to like GSM. There should be, 
I wish my phone had an option where I can disable GSM and I know for, for a fact that GSM is not working. And then if I'm ever stuck on the road in the middle of nowhere and I only have GSM coverage, I'll enable GSM to make a phone call. But, uh, you know, again, that's implementation dependent. Yes? Um, uh, piggybacking off of implementation, did, what uh, manufacturer did you look at for your uh, base station? And do you notice, like, uh, differences between how the protocol is implemented uh, in terms of security uh, over, like, Nokia, Ericsson, or Huawei? Yeah, um, so I did look to a couple different uh, vendors. Um, I, I'm not going to say which ones. Um, and no, I didn't notice any difference. I want to make it very clear, like, this is not an issue from any telco or OEM or, like, vendor or anything. This is a, an issue with the standards themselves. I have just a partial view doing this type of analysis, but based with this type of analysis, I did not notice any difference. Everything was exactly the same. A, uh, a bootstrapping algorithm that's available for jamming situation is called BBC. I forget what the first B is, but the second B is Baird, B-A-I-R-D, and the third one is Collins. Have, are you aware of the BBC algorithm as a possible bootstrapping for share? For, it's, a, it's a low data rate algorithm, but it, it does let you, say, share a key, a cryptographic key. Oh, I'm actually not familiar with that. But any, so if you guys think of ideas like known technology that could be used to solve this problem, you should definitely talk about it. And I'm being has to stop, by the way. Yeah, you should definitely talk about it and like bring it up to the attention. And like you know, again, like uh, the more people we work on this and we get on this, we'll hopefully get uh, the industry to solve the issue. But no, I have never heard about that. Thank you. I'm being asked to stop. So with that, I'll say goodbye. Uh, thank you.